Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Dr. Erica Mallory Blythe, and uh, my background is emergency trauma medicine. So I've run trauma teams throughout the UK and abroad for over a decade. But about six years ago, I became interested in radiation research. And currently, I'm a founder of the group FIRE, which is Physicians Health Initiative for Radiation and Environment. I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. I'm a trustee for the Radiation Research Trust, a board member for the CPTF, that's an American-based group, a medical advisor for a group called ESUK, and a member of the British Society of Ecological Medicine. And the reason that we're doing this presentation today is to increase awareness, really, about the use of electromagnetic fields, particularly in a school environment and around children. And this is Hippocrates saying, first, do no harm, which is obviously extremely relevant with the background that I come from in hospital, where we're cutting people open and irradiating them and shoving needles in them. It's not something that you would necessarily think of when you're looking at a school environment. Unfortunately, I think with the advent of a number of new evolutions, if you like, in public buildings in general, and that includes toxic chemicals and the use of microwave fields, this is something that we need to start thinking about again and remembering, because education has to come secondary to health. And that's underlying this whole talk, really. That's a really important principle. And this is a certificate that some of you may be familiar with, but I'm guessing most of you won't. This was issued by the World Health Organization in 2011 via IARC, which is the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And what this certificate says is that microwave radiation or radio frequency radiation is classified as a group 2B carcinogen. That means possibly cancerous to humans. And I'm going to come back to that important point in more detail towards the end. But what I plan to cover today is briefly at the beginning to take a common sense approach, look at humans and evolution and say, well, should we expect these fields to affect our health? Then talk about current safety guidelines and mechanisms of damage of EMF type fields of this kind, the health outcomes of those, specific vulnerabilities of children. I, I put here robustness of argument and the reason I put that down is because any one of us can sit in a public place these days and look around and you would say there are no concerns, that there's nothing to fear, there's nothing that should limit our use of this technology because it's so prolific. And so, but it is becoming a hot topic in a different forum, that is in a medical and scientific forum, and to some extent in the political one. So, given that most people don't have any concerns, I feel that my role here today, in, as it is in the organisations that I support, is to give a little bit of the other side of the coin, if you like, the other side of the argument. Um, and then a very quick bit at the end about practical solutions and optimising the environment. I really wish that was longer because that is an entire lecture in itself. So I'm hoping that I might be invited back to give a, a workshop on that specific area of this for people for their homes and in a school environment. I don't, I, I'm uh, humble enough not to try and answer a question like this in an hour, but from a very crude point of view, as a doctor, if I'm looking for the presence or absence of life in an organism, I have some tools that I can use. And what I would be looking for, if I don't have any other clues, is the absence or presence of an electromagnetic field. Because you could say, in a very simple terms, that the outward evidence of that, the ECG, the electrocardiogram, the EEG here on the right, the brain waves, the action potential on the left there, that's a muscle contraction. What shows us the absence or presence of life is electricity from within our bodies because that's how we work, we're heavily reliant on it. And we don't just put out an electromagnetic field as you can see from these. We also, we're two-way transmission antennas. DNA is a fractal antenna at a molecular level and each of your systems is heavily reliant on these fields but then your whole, your whole organism is a walking antenna that's extremely efficient as a conductor. And this is quite sensible because our bodies have evolved to cue into very subtle, tiny fields in our environment to regulate our biorhythms, our sleep-wake cycle, for example. 
And of course we're not alone, and this is a group of species who've honed those electromagnetic sensors and used them to their advantage for things like finding prey or navigation or migration. And they possess biogenic um, iron-bound particles called magnetite that help them to do that. And as humans, we also have those particles in our brain. And when people try to allay concerns that are developing over this sudden increase in fields around us, they'll often say, but we evolved in a field. And we did. We evolved in the inner field, but it bears no resemblance to the field that we see around us now. And that's because if you measure ambient fields in our environment now, they are a billion to a billion billion times higher than that very subtle field that we evolved to deal with. And there are a lot of other differences, not just signal strength. And to give you a snapshot of how fast that's happened, it's happened in evolutionary terms in the blink of an eye, in the beat of a heart. It's happened in my lifetime. I was born in 1975, and you can see this is an exponential looking curve. So it's happened really fast, and it hasn't seen one generation from cradle to grave. And when somebody asks me in medicine, is this safe? I have a quick think to myself, has it seen one generation through? Because if it hasn't, I don't think you can fully answer that question. And some scientists would argue you can't actually answer that question until it's seen several generations from cradle to grave. So this enormous change has happened extremely fast. And the part of the spectrum that I'm going to focus on today is the microwave part that you can see towards there on the left, the longer wavelengths. The higher frequencies over here, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet as well, are ionising radiation. So they can knock electrons out of their shells and that's one of the ways in which they do damage, damage leading for, to, for example, cancer. Everything below that can't do that. It's not ionising. So it has different ways of interfering with biology. And we'll come on to those. But the types of devices that emit this kind of radiation are numerous. They're huge. And this is a very small sample of common everyday ones, certainly ones that you would find in a school. A Wi-Fi router, a decked phone, those are the walkabout cordless landlines. And they, and not many people know that those emit continuously, whether you're using them or not. The base station emits 24 hours a day. Uh, mobile phone there, security system. RFID tags, that's quite a new concept, but again, coming into schools certain types of lighting, baby monitors, of course laptops and tablets and smart meters. And this slide here, um, that's a logarithmic scale on the left, so the difference between the bottom and the top of this chart is far greater than it appears. It's been condensed if you like. But all I really want you to notice from this is that the Wi-Fi access point on the far right there and the laptop, just down from it, wireless laptop, have signal strengths that are higher than a mobile phone base station. Now the relevance of that is that in around 2000, the Stuart report, um, Sir William Stuart, it was a commissioned report by the government at the time to look into health effects of this kind of radiation. And they made a statement that no part of a school or the school's grounds should fall in the highest intensity beam of a mobile phone base station because of health concerns. I think very smart advice. Unfortunately, we didn't take any notice of that advice because we are now putting devices inside classrooms that have a higher signal strength than 100 metres from your mobile phone base station. And this is the output from a laptop at 50 centimetres, that's half a metre. And we know that because intensity is a factor of the power of the distance, that as you bring that closer, even very small uh, decreases in distance will mean much greater intensities. So this could be an underestimation, if anything. And children won't be using these devices at half a metre. They're small and they use them very close, in fact, sometimes right on their lap. But we have guidelines, and the guidelines that we currently adhere to here in the UK are known as the ICNIRP guidelines. Um, they are obsolete. They were devised in the 90s and they, are, they were devised only to protect you against thermal effects. That means actual tissue heating. But what we now know, because there are thousands and thousands of papers on this, is that there are a huge number of effects that happen well below that thermal level. And we call those non-thermal effects, non-heating effects. In, in many ways, I think this, again, it's common sense. It's actually not very surprising. And that information has been around since the 50s. 
but that literature has accumulated very fast in recent years in response to the increase in fields. And don't take my word for that. This is a SAMPS dated certificate from the United States Environmental Protection Agency discussing the fact that they don't protect against non-thermal effects. And the last sentence, therefore, there says, therefore the generalisation by many that the guidelines protect human beings from harm by any or all me mechanisms is not justified. This looks like a very busy, complicated graph, so I'll explain it. At the top here, that very long horizontal blue line, that's the ICNIRP guidelines that I've just mentioned. And um, underneath that in green are typical exposures, and we're looking here at power or signal strength, typical exposures from common appliances. And highlighted with the arrows in red, that's a Wi-Fi enabled laptop and a Wi-Fi router. And as you can see, their emissions come below the exposure standards, so that's good to know. What's less good to know is that here in red, these are peer-reviewed published papers that show health effects, very serious health effects if you're able to cast your eyes over some of these, but DNA damage, blood-brain barrier damage, miscarriage, etc. Also, well within those guidelines, underneath them, but also in the signal strengths that are typically produced by these kinds of devices. And this is another chart, again, just briefly cast your eyes over it, I don't expect you to read it, but as you can see, every system affected here, there's all sorts of different parts of the body mentioned with some pretty serious symptoms, and all of these, again, they're happening underneath the maximum values that can be produced by laptops, etc. Now, some countries have responded to this in a very serious way. And they have changed their biological guideline levels to be more what we call biologically based in response to that literature. And this is a whole list of ones that, as you can see, they are orders and orders of magnitude below ours. Okay. And some people, I, as, a, as a professional in this country with an interest in health, I find that embarrassing. But I don't think our children will find that embarrassing. I think they'll find it unforgivable. And it's not all about power, that's a huge oversimplification. What we've just talked about, those guidelines and the ways we've measured the output from those devices, that's all based on power. But in a real life scenario, it is far more complicated than that when you're trying to assess biological damage. And impact depends on cumulative exposure, so a bit like cigarette smoking, your lifetime exposure. And you may, you may think that um, the higher the frequency, or the, the greater the intensity of the radiation, the worse the biological outcome. This, unfortunately, is also not true. These things are not linear, they're not predictable. And what we know is that there are intensity windows and frequency windows that exist where, conversely to what you might expect, a, a smaller amount of radiation in terms of intensity can be more destructive to tissue than its higher counterparts. And in practice, what that means is by moving something away, which we think instinctively will help, if you're unlucky, that could actually pop you into one of those biological intensity windows that causes greater interference with your system. And uh, the other ones on there were about morphology. The sine waves that were around when I was a child in the 70s in the form of radio transmissions, those nice smooth sine waves are much more acceptable to biology than what we see now, which is pulsed. Um, the morphology is different. We have pulsed waves and information carrying waves that have an extremely complicated signature output and that is also more interfering with biology than others. And to just take it up a notch, we've, we've got another even more complicated situation and I'll just come over here to the whiteboard to, if you can all that. I'm just going to briefly help you to imagine a real life situation where we might have a teacher sat at her desk and she will possibly have a tablet. And then she's got a lot of children sat in front of her, and they may also all have tablets, all of which are emitting their own fields. And we might have a radiator here to keep them warm, and a filing cabinet, let's say. She might have a phone in her handbag. And of course, there's a Wi-Fi router somewhere. Let's pop it back here. But each one of these devices is emitting its own field, each one. And you'll know from your GCSE physics all about constructive interference and the fact that if you get two waves which look the same and they synchronise with each other, then the additive effect can be a wave that is amplified. So this creates hot spots that you can't predict. And not only that, but you might get some reflection of these metal surfaces, your filing cabinet, your radiator, and it all gets extremely complicated in there. 
Not only that, but of course, it's not two-dimensional like that. It's three-dimensional because these have floors above them and to the sides. So everything is overlapping in a way that leaves us in a situation where we can't really say anything about the intensities of those fields unless we measure every single spot in the room. But to make it just a little bit more complicated, inside your body, your different types of tissues will absorb differently. They have a different SAR, specific absorption rate, depending on their water content and their density. So just like food in a microwave, some of it gets really hot if it has a high water content, and some of it doesn't cook at all. The same thing happens inside a person's body. And of course, they may be carrying metal. We've talked about metal in the room, but what about metal on their belts? or their teeth, their dental braces or amalgams, or their hair clips. This can reflect and absorb fields in a way that, again, makes them very unpredictable. And not all of the children in those classrooms, they're not like the Wi-Fi routers that came off the production line. They're all different. They're different shapes and sizes, ages sometimes. And if they have underlying illness, that will also make them more vulnerable. So it doesn't look like this. That looks complicated enough. It's three-dimensional, and I have no idea what that would look like. It's been very difficult for people to map, but there's a few ideas there. But so what? So what does it mean that we're bathed in these very complex patterns of new or novel EMF? Well, looking at a cellular level, one of the things that we know happens is that this kind of microwave radiation can increase calcium movement through the wall of the cell, the membrane. And that can set up, this is a nitric oxide cycle, which produces something called reactive oxygen species. You don't need to understand what that means, but it's a process called oxidative stress. And those ROS, or reactive oxygen species, damage tissue. So when they're produced, they're what contributes to the aging process, and they can induce cancer. Um, so EMF causes this effect, and that can set up this very negative cycle. That's just one of many mechanisms, and it's, it becomes incredibly complex. But looking inside the cell, it can affect lots of different parts. And, and you can get not just that, uh, that cycle of destruction, but the calcium ions themselves, if you have more than you should have inside a cell, they can sort of be shaken by this alternating current because they have an ionic charge, and that itself can be destructive to organelles inside the cell. So with the nucleus here, um, that can cause damage to the genes and the DNA, the chromosomes. The endoplasmic reticulum, that's where your proteins are manufactured and folded very carefully in a specific way, and it can interfere with that folding. It can also cause the production of something called heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins are produced in other conditions like inflammation and infection, and we can actually use them as markers of illness. They are created by this kind of EMF. The mitochondria, that's the powerhouse of your cell, it's what gives you energy. That can be affected and its DNA inside it can be affected. I talked about the, the problem with calcium flooding in through the cell membrane, but other parts of the cell membrane can be damaged too, like gap junctions. They're what allows two cells to communicate between each other, send messages directly to each other. Those are very important in the heart and the brain tissues in order to synchronise neural activity. And uh, this can destroy those gap junctions. Um, Barriers, there's very important membranous barriers, but I'm going to come on to that and show you a slide a bit later. Growth, proliferation of the cell can be altered, and apoptosis. What that means is cell death. And it's very important, apoptosis means programmed cell death. It's when a cell commits suicide, if you like, because either it's come to the end of its lifespan or it's defective in some way. And this type of EMF can, in, can increase the rate of that process, causing degeneration of tissues, or it can stop cells committing suicide when they should have done, allowing them to replicate even though they're defective, which, as you can imagine, is implicated in malignancy. Um, now, I mentioned DNA damage. This is a test called the comet assay. And what we do is take a ball of DNA and we put it in an alkaline solution, and then we electrophorese it. And if there are any damaged parts of DNA that are not hanging on well to that, to that ball, they get pulled away to the anode, and they form this comet-like tail. You can measure the length and the density of that tail, and it gives you a quantitative assessment of damage. On the left, you can see a healthy ball of DNA with no toxic exposure. 
In the middle, that's a ball of DNA that's been exposed to gamma irradiation, ionizing, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, equivalent to about 1,600 chest X-rays. That's a very large dose of radiation that we know is implicated in cancerous or malignant processes. But here on the right, that's in response to just 24 hours of mobile phone radiation. Now, we know it's not happening via the same mechanism. It's not electrons being pushed out of their shells. It's a different mechanism. But as you can see, the amount of DNA damage is very comparable. And that's only 24 hours. Right. And that's at the allowable guidelines. And of course, many of us are exposed 24 hours a day, seven days a week for our entire lives. This, this interestingly, the study was actually done by industry to replicate some non-industry studies that, that had been done. I think in the hope that it wouldn't show the same thing, but it did. You have to take some cheap shots at this time of night to keep everyone awake. <laughs> but I won't apologise for this slide because it has a really important message. Speaking of DNA damage as we just were, many of you will already be aware of the links between cell phone usage and brain tumours. But what you might not be aware of is other types of cancer that have also been linked in the literature. And many of you in response to this information may have bought headsets, etc. to allow your phone to be used somewhere further away from your brain. Unfortunately, that does not protect you. And the reason I say that is because um, tissue like this, some women have a habit of carrying their phone in their bra. Men often carry their phone in their pocket, very close to their genitalia. Those tissues actually have no bone shielding. So they absorb, and they're, very, they're quite fatty, watery tissues, so they absorb extremely well. They actually have higher SARS, or specific absorption rates, than brain tissue, because they don't have this bony shield. So all you're doing is you're moving the damage to a different part of your body that is actually probably more sensitive to it. And there are women out there who believe that their breast tumours have been caused by their cell phones. Why? Because the breast tumours appeared right behind the phone where they were carrying it, exactly behind it. And the surgeons themselves have also become concerned and they've published a case series of breast cancers that, where the surgeons believe that it was related. And in one case at least, the tumour actually was the shape of the phone. There were lots of small tumours, highly aggressive tumours in very young women. And that is a mammogram at the top left there of one of those such tumours that was felt to be caused by a cell phone. But all of these different types of tumours are linked to this kind of radiation and many more. In the top right, that's a retinal melanoma. Um, acoustic neuroma is that little red blob inside the brain. That's a benign tumour, but it can still kill you because of its uh, delicate position in the brain. It's the one that goes to the ear, which is why it's kind of not surprising it's related to cell phone use. And it satisfies what we call the Hill criteria for causality from this kind of radiation. That is criteria that we set up, the scientific community set up to determine does X cause Y? And it satisfies those criteria. That's malignant melanoma, and some dermatologists are asking, why are we seeing this increase in malignant melanoma in areas of the skin that aren't generally exposed to sunlight? And some are answering back, this is why they think it is. The salivary gland down here, the parotid, unsurprisingly again, it's very close to where you use your cell phone. And then here, the glioma, the one that many of you might be familiar with. This is a highly aggressive tumor. The five year survival is pretty much zero. We have no way of curing it and it also satisfies the Hill criteria for causality from cell phone use. And it's not just the scientific community that have pointed out that it's, it's causal. This was deemed in a court of law and um, received compensation for his brain tumour from a cell phone. But more topically for this year, this is 2014 report um, where there's a current class action lawsuit from about 13 or 14 people in the States with brain tumours and share prices in the companies they're seeing have already dropped by 5.5 billion, even though the case has only just started. The World Health Organization is predicting a tidal wave of cancers. And I put this slide up really to allow you to just digest the distribution of those. In dark blue, that's the highest incidence. I found that quite interesting myself. So we've talked about um, things very small inside the cell um, and on the outside of the cell at the membrane. This is at a cellular, whole cellular level. So this is red blood cells and on the far left there you see happy red blood cells, healthily, mutually repellent because they have a negative charge on their surface so they bounce off each other. Here in the middle, that's after 10 minutes on a cordless phone and you can see they've stacked up like coins in a coin roll. 
That's called rouleau formation and it's a pathological process. It stops them doing their function of carrying oxygen correctly and a few other things. Um, and you can see the same thing after 70 minutes at a Wi-Fi enabled computer. And I repeated this test myself because it's had a bit of criticism and some people aren't sure and I found a very similar result. So we've looked at inside cells and cellular levels. Now when we put all those cells together we get systems like the heart system or the lung system. And I'll start with the nervous system because that's highly electrically dependent. What we know is that this type of EMF can stimulate your fight and flight nervous system. That's your run from a lion nervous system. You evolved to be able to kick that into action so you could release adrenaline and fight or fly. And um, it doesn't have to be a conscious trigger like a lion to cause that. This kind of EMF causes it even though you're not aware of it. And you can imagine that if you're exposed all the time, that nervous system is having to fight inside your body all the time. And the energy for that has to come from somewhere. You have to pay for that. And you pay with the kind of reverse of that, which is your parasympathetic nervous system, your rest, digest, grow, nurture, heal system. For short periods of time, like when you're running from a line, that's very sensible and, and it's fine. But if you do that continuously over a long period of time, then your body will not be able to do things like repair its immune system. In addition to that, there are a few other hostile threats to your immune system from this kind of radiation. One of them is suppression of melatonin production. Melatonin is your body's most potent endogenous from inside the body antioxidant, or it means anti-aging or cancer-fighting agent. And this kind of EMF suppresses the production of that. It stops it being produced in the right quantities. If that weren't enough, there's some apparent direct effects on immune cells, like natural killer cells and lymphocytes, that help you fight infection, disease, cancer, etc. These others I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail, one by one. Reproductive health effects, I think, are increasingly important, and especially important when we're looking at young populations of children in schools. And I've chosen these images to loosely represent a cycle of life, if you like. So if we start in the middle, boy meets girl, generally these days on Facebook or Twitter. But let's say they fall in love and they want to start a family. Figures are variable, but I've seen everything from one in five to one in three couples struggling to conceive. That's the figures out in the literature. That's an enormous number. And this type of EMF affects every part of that cycle. If we start with the brain, we know that Wi-Fi can interfere with memory function, cognitive ability, behavior. So that could impair your chances of successfully finding a mate. But more specifically, it also affects certain glands, like the pineal gland, the pituitary, that help regulate your reproductive cycles and producing sperm and eggs. There's some direct effects then on sperm and eggs. And sperm, we know there's alterations to morphology. So that means uh, the way they look, their structure. Two heads, no tails, that kind of thing. Um, and their motility, the way they swim. Um, and there's some uh, research that shows that sperm can die three times faster when it's been more highly exposed to radiation than that that doesn't. And I'll show you some statistics in a moment. Eggs, there's less studies on. Um, there's lots of studies on sperm, and I'm guessing that's to do with collection methods. But um, even the few studies on eggs show cause for concern. And one of the reasons that I'm most alarmed by this is little girls are born with all the eggs they'll ever have. They can't produce new ones the way that boys can produce sperm. So if those eggs are damaged or destroyed at any point, even this may start in utero when they're formed, they can never be repaired. And the damage that occurs could be passed on, if they're lucky enough to conceive, could be passed on to the next generation. And let's say they are lucky enough to conceive. If in either one of these couple have had a higher than average radiation exposure or the sorts of radiation exposures that we're looking at now with common devices, their rate of miscarriage, fetal malformation, and DNA damage that can be passed on is higher. And that damage can be passed on from generation to generation to generation, and in fact amplified if the exposures continue. So you can see we've completed that cycle. And here's, I, I said you'd have some statistics and some papers. There are many papers now on this subject. But um, I like this study, McGrath and Xenos. This was interesting because they looked at rodents in the type of... Um, microwave radiation emitted from a mobile phone base station, but at allowable limits, and they found that after five generations, there were lots of problems in each generation, but after five complete generations, there was complete infertility. The entire 
tested lots of animals were completely infertile. Professor Agarwal, Agarwal looks at uh, men who keep cell phones in their pockets, I've mentioned this, close to their genitalia, and those who keep them in their pockets for greater than four hours a day have half the sperm count of those who don't. And Wi-Fi has been shown to damage sperm by non-thermal effects at the kinds of levels that you'd experience using a laptop in a normal way. I can give you um, accounts of lots of papers like this. And thank you to C4ST uh, via Stop Smart Meters for this little video looking at happy sperm, not exposed to anything, looking healthy, they look like you'd expect a sperm to look like a small tadpole, and then sperm exposed to some cell phone radiation. And they don't look like good swimmers to me. That's only 12 hours. Okay. They do. And in response to this growing body of literature, my colleagues at the Radiation Research Trust put this poster together that they put in men's urinals to try to allow men to make that choice and give them information to help them protect their future. I mentioned to you important barriers in the body, and barriers are there to protect really special tissue, like the brain, like the eye, the ovaries, the testes, the gut, and this is the brain of a rat that's been exposed to only two hours of cell phone radiation at less than the allowable guidelines. All of the brown staining that's there is a substance called albumin. It's a protein and it should be inside the blood. It should not have leaked out into the brain tissue where it can damage neurons as it has in this case. But what I find really interesting about this brilliant research by Leif Salford is that this happened in its greatest intensity at a lower intensity of microwave radiation. I spoke to you at the beginning about the fact that there is these intensity windows where you can drop the intensity and see a worse effect. This is one of them and there are many other examples of this in the literature. And this process interestingly is, is becoming implicated possibly in things like Alzheimer's and autism which are becoming themselves epidemic. So something we need to take very seriously. This is a slide looking at the red and orange stain that you can see is greater on the left is a gentleman who's been exposed to 50 minutes of mobile phone type radiation. I mentioned this, I, I just talked about Alzheimer's a little. Um, Alzheimer's along with other dementias is predicted to double by two, 2030 and possibly triple by 2050 if it continues to rise at the present rate. That is an epidemic that we're in the middle of now. And Alzheimer's is sometimes known as, as diabetes of the brain because we see the same picture in people with Alzheimer's. At the very beginning, when I showed you inside the cell the nitric oxide cycle causing damage via oxidative stress, that's what I'm talking about here. It can, it's not just the nitric oxide cycle, there are many others. And they can cause damage to every system of your body. All cells are vulnerable at different, in different levels. And I just want you to cast your eyes around all of these different disease processes, many of which you'll be familiar with, and many of which you will know yourselves are, is escalating. So this type of radiation causes oxidative stress. There's a massive number of papers now, and the vast majority, like 80% plus, show a positive effect that we are causing oxidative stress with that kind of radiation. I've talked through a small number of a very large amount of literature. So it's a drop in the ocean, really, but we're all fighting cancer every day of our lives. On a molecular level, there, there's DNA breakages and little problems all the time, but we have lots of fail-safes and ways of correcting that damage and fixing it as it occurs. The problem is, this type of radiation causes more damage, but also it decreases our ability to repair that damage. It saturates repair mechanisms. So you can imagine that this balance that we're supposed to have, if, if the damage goes up and the repair capacity goes down, it won't be long until you slip into a type of disease process. And these are all linked with the MF exposure in the literature, but very loosely on the left, this is things that might be more likely to affect a child, and on the right, things perhaps more likely to affect an adult. What's sad is that many of these things on the right are moving into younger and younger populations. And specifically, I would highlight things like depression and insomnia, which are now a huge problem in children, in small children. Children shouldn't be depressed, and children know how to sleep. We often talk about sleeping like a baby or sleeping like a small child, because that's something that we inherently all know should come naturally to a child. But it's starting not to. This is starting to be a huge problem for adults as well. Um, Alzheimer's, as I mentioned, is epidemic. Autism is too. Um, 
Children are more vulnerable, and there's a really long list of reasons for that, but this is just a few. I mentioned shielding of the skull, and they have thinner skulls, so less shielding. Their brains have a higher water composition, so they absorb radiation far more efficiently. Their heads are smaller, so they're more fully enveloped by the fields, and their nervous system and reproductive system and all their other systems are still developing. Certain developing cells, especially stem cells, are more sensitive to this kind of radiation. And of course, we don't actually know the full catalogue of long-term effects because we haven't got there yet, because we haven't seen this generation through. So I can tell you about some effects, but nobody can tell you about the full potential. A longer time for latent effects, I've mentioned with stem cells, but when you look at ionising radiation, and we've seen that some of the damage looks very similar, Ionising radiation has latent effects that can be up to, to decades later, 30 to 40 years, and we know that from things like x-rays in hospital, but also from atomic bomb fallouts and things like that. Often the increase in cancers hasn't happened for many decades following. So there are some effects from this radiation that are immediate, they're measurable, and I've told you about some of those, but there are some that we're yet to see. And some statistics, a five-year-old can absorb 60% more microwave radiation and the exposures in their bone marrow can be up to 10 times greater. We would expect that the products that we're giving them and we're using ourselves were pre-market safety tested for health. The best testing that's been done on these kinds of devices that emit this kind of radiation was done on cell phones because that was the first thing that we got. And they tested cell phones for safety on SAM. SAM stands for Standard Anthropomorphic Mannequin, and he represents the 90th percentile of military recruits. He has a body weight of 100 kilograms. So he bears no resemblance to your child, but actually also not your wife, and he's even not representative of an average man, because an average man weighs 70 kilograms. So this was an unusual choice for safety testing. But on top of that, the standard that they used was tissue heating. It was the obsolete thermal effect that we know is no longer relevant because there are thousands of papers showing effects well below that. On top of that, the only dosimetric quantity they used to assess the radiation level was SAR, specific absorption rate, which cannot be estimated for a complex organ like the brain. They had a ubiquitous blancmange-like substance just sat there. That's nothing like a brain. It doesn't contain living tissue and it's all one density. Also, they only looked at a six minute phone call. They averaged it over that. We all know that many teenagers will sit on their phone for a lot longer than that. But perhaps the most concerning thing of all is that that standard can be exceeded by using these devices in a normal way. And when I say in a normal way, if you read the um, fine print in your device manuals, it will tell you you have to use these devices within a certain distance of your body or without a certain distance from your body. And that's usually about 15 millimetres. And lots of people use their phones pressed to their ear when they can't hear, etc. And that exceeds those guidelines potentially when you do that. And you can see here penetration compared with the, the brain of a five-year-old compared with an adult is penetrating far more deeply for all the reasons that I initially pointed out. And we are seeing a rise in brain tumours. This is young people. This is people under the age of 30 in its temporal and frontal lobe tumours that we would potentially associate with self phone use. And lots of doctors are asking, why is this happening? Why are we seeing this increase in paediatric childhood brain tumours? And many of them don't know a lot of the medical information that I've just given you because a lot of them are similar age to me or even older and they weren't taught this in medical school. They were also born around 1975 and they had no education on this whatsoever, either in their medical lifetime or after they'd done their degree. Brain tumour has overtaken leukaemia as the leading cause of non-accidental death in children and both of those were actually connected with EMF exposure. There's a 5 to 10% annual rise in, in tumours, depending on which literature you have a look at, and survival hasn't improved in my lifetime. And they make this comment, no behavioural change has been shown to affect incidents. There's nothing that we've changed that we can improve outcome or lessen the number of tumours happening. But nobody has tried reducing EMF fields in their environment. Quite the opposite, they're continuing to escalate on a daily basis. And of course, in a school situation, it's not all about children. There are adults there. 
There are teachers, there are staff, and some of those staff may be pregnant and carrying a fetus. But looking at the microwave distribution of a distant device, you can see that you get these hot spots, like I mentioned. And this is um, in yellow and white, hot spots at the wrists and ankles where your body constricts and it's concentrated. And also the nose and the genitalia where there's no bone shielding. And this pattern changes if you have a point source close to you, like a laptop. I showed you a graph at the beginning which um, demonstrated the ambient rise in everyday exposures. And that's still there, that's the blue line. The red line shows you the rise in autistic spectrum disorders. Now, this doesn't imply anything causal. I, I couldn't possibly extrapolate to that. So no graph can do alone, on its own. But when you connect this graph with the ever-growing mechanistic data and peer-reviewed published papers that suggest a link and give reasons, medical reasons, as to why that link exists, then this becomes interesting. And you have to take that seriously. And look how remarkably similar that curve that comes up around 1995 to 2000 is to this one. It's almost identical, isn't it? This is a curve showing you the incidence of electromagnetic hypersensitivity. That's beyond the scope of my talk today, really, but it is a subject of great interest of mine, and I'm very happy to answer questions on the end about that. Um, but it's a, um, it's a condition that is caused by radio frequency exposure and some other exposures of similar types of EMF um, that gives a constellation of symptoms that commonly things like discomfort on the telephone or pain using a telephone, cardiac palpitations, dizziness, headaches, visual and auditory dis disturbance, etc. And this is people who've noticed that they get those symptoms around wireless devices. And if you plot the number of them and how they've increased, by 2017, if you extrapolate that graph, 50% of the population will be affected. Now, that sounds quite astonishing. But I'll be honest, this is a subject I've researched heavily. I actually think that's potentially an underestimation. And the reason I say that is because that's extrapolating a graph that's based on information from people who've made that connection, that they believe their palpitations or dizziness were caused by their Wi-Fi router. The number of people who have those kind of very common symptoms but have never connected them with exposure is much larger because they're, they're bathed in that kind of radiation 24 hours a day. It's very difficult to know what's causing it when you're in that situation. Mm -hmm. And this adds weight to my concern that that might be the truth because this shows many of the symptoms I just mentioned. Headaches, sleep disturbance, depression, loss of memory, skin problems, visual disruption, hearing disruption, dizziness, cardiovascular problems, hallmark symptoms of electromagnetic hypersensitivity, but not in people who believe they have EHS. This is in a dose-response fashion, depending on how close you live to a mobile phone base station. So these are people who have exactly the same symptoms, but they're not saying it's caused by their Wi-Fi router. They are, have just been asked to fill in a questionnaire. If they live close to the station, they have these symptoms. If they don't, they have less of them. Oh, and this is uh, just showing you there's quite a lot of different studies that show that same data. That just happens to be one of them. But I found it interesting looking through the literature that this kind of study has been repeated quite a lot of times now. And all of the different symptoms, this constellation that I'm talking about, keeps being seen time and time again in each one of them. We won't go through them all right now. And there's a, a common misconception that all the literature that exists is about telephone, mobile telephone use. It's true that there's a lot in that category because that's the first devices that we had. But there's, there are plenty of Wi-Fi publications now looking at that kind of exposure rather than telephones. And this is a small amount of it. But again, I can give you links if you're interested at the end to a, a much longer list of publications that are relevant to Wi-Fi. And we haven't really talked about tablets, but the government have put forward this warning. The Department of Health states... Children and young people under 16 should not be using their phones except for essential calls. Just out of interest, can you raise your hand if, you've, if you knew about this warning? So a very small number of people in the room. And that doesn't surprise me because it's quite hard to find. It's kind of buried on their website. But there's been no awareness campaign about that. That very important message that is sensible. That make, that's common sense given the, all the literature that now exists. What isn't common sense, and this is confusing me, is that at the same time as telling you that your children should be limiting their exposure to their mobile phones, they've got, they've got plans like the one-on-one -on -one iPad scheme in schools where they're saying, 
Well, don't use your phone, but we're going to give you a tablet which has a potentially higher specific absorption rate than that phone. And we would like you to use that in school. That's a bit counterintuitive, that makes no sense to me. What I've heard in terms of defence for that is that they're saying it's okay because it's not near your brain. And what we're worried about is brain tumours that are caused by cell phones. That's ludicrous, given what I've already told you about the fact that there could be higher absorption rates in other tissues in the body. And children are using these on their laps right next to their genitalia and their delicate abdominal organs. So you're, again, you're just moving the site of damage to somewhere where it could actually be more destructive. In addition to that, phones, smartphones, um, have something called APC, that means adaptive power control. What that means is that if they don't need to use full power, they can down power and put out a fraction of their total maximum capacity. Tablets can't do that. They have a feature where they can drop their power when they're in contact with your lap, but that doesn't work on a desk, for example. So they're emitting on full power the whole time that you're using them. In terms of literature, I couldn't possibly tell you how many papers there are out there because there are many thousand. But there's a group put together called the Bioinitiative Working Group and they are extremely eminent within this field. They are qualified in every sense and including three former presidents of the Bioelectromagnetic Society. That's people whose raison d'etre is this subject. They're the most qualified of their field. And they looked at over 5,000 papers, starting many years ago and with an update in uh, 2012. And these are the things that they highlighted as their points of concern. I've already mentioned all these, so I won't go through them again. But um, they also issued a 2014 update. And I'll just quote from them in that. Sensitive populations, including the developing fetus, the infant, children, the elderly, and those with pre-existing chronic diseases, and those with developed electrical hypersensitivity must be protected. They also say wireless laptops and other wireless devices should be strongly discouraged in schools for children of all ages. I think that's a, a very important message from an extremely highly esteemed group. And that message has been echoed in, by many different medical groups and, and political organisations globally now. <coughs> Whilst we're talking about research, I think there are lots of common misconceptions. Misconceptions that I had for most of my career. I was extremely naive. And I've learnt, really, when it came to this subject, so in recent years, that research isn't what you would hope it would be. If something is peer-reviewed and published, that doesn't mean it tells you the truth. It only has the integrity of the people who designed it. And we're human, there are flaws, we have agendas. There are lots of things that don't even have, happen on a conscious level, but they can be seen if you look at the data closely. And one positive study does not counterbalance a negative one, or vice versa. So, if somebody handed you 10 papers on this and said, those show cause for concern, but here's another 10 and they don't show cause for concern, does that mean you have no cause for concern? Absolutely not. Because it can be so much harder to, to demonstrate an effect than it is to fail to find one. That's common sense. Once again, it's, it's obvious logic, but this is an argument that some, in some cases has been used. Um, and in terms of whose opinion should you listen to, I think that's a really difficult one. Because where do you turn? And one of the things that comes from um, our group here in this country, the Public Health England, previously known as the Health Protection Agency, but they changed their name, um, they often say that there's no need for concern because they, the data is not consistent. Of course it's not consistent. We wouldn't expect consistency because these are biological systems, they're non-linear. Each organism is different. So we don't expect consistency. And this is a lovely quote, I think, from the Selton Scientific Panel, who, again, are heavily involved in this subject, great academics, pointing out that consistency is not necessary at all to demonstrate biological concern. And in fact, if you did see consistency, if every paper did show an effect, that would be very suspicious because that's not how biology works. This is the Agnea report that was put together in 2012. And one thing that really concerns me about this report is that even though it happened in 2012, and in 2011, the World Health Organization via IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, classified this type of radiation as a class 2B or group 2B carcinogen, 
That piece of information is not in this report. It's a very lengthy report, several hundred pages, and that fact was nowhere in that report. What they do point out is that, yes, they've done a few studies that raise some concerns about behavioural problems um, connected with RF in children that deserve a little bit more investigation. So why is that? Why did they not write that in that report? It's confusing. And I would say we don't have to look back very far to see that we've made this mistake over and over again. Only this time, there are many scientists now who are predicting this to be the worst public health disaster in human history. Why? Because these regrettable toxic exposures happened to subsets of the population. But this is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It's not just affecting all of us, it's affecting all of our children and potentially the next generation. So there are some that are predicting this to make this look like a child's play. He who has the gold makes the rules, in the words of Andrew Marino in his book Going Somewhere. But this is a fact. This was published by, well, this was put together by Henry Lai, who again is expert in this field. He looked at industry-funded literature, and they would have you believe with 72% certainty that there's nothing to worry about. But that kind of literature, with an obvious financial bias, has not been taken account in, in courts of law because it's felt to be biased. And if we look at the majority of literature, which is still independent, we see that the overwhelming majority says there is cause for concern. There is something to see here. So I mentioned to you that the government are saying under 16s should not use cell phones except in essential circumstances. They are also doing some research because they notice these possible cognitive and behavioural problems. And I quote from their website, this is on the SCAMP study, which is some research that's going now. This research will improve understanding of children's radio frequency exposures and whether there is any cognitive or behavioural effects linked to the exposure. So that's a direct admission that they accept that there might be. And they've already said they're concerned that there, there is. So it's good that they're looking into it. What concerns me a little is that this is jointly funded by the um, Department of Health and the telecommunications industry, both of whom one would expect to have a financial interest in this subject, and we already know that that bias is literature. Let's hope not. And I'm not personally a big fan of animal studies, but what is not a step forward, what is not progressive, is replacing them with our children. And I quote here from the same website about the same study. There are unlikely to be any direct benefits to your children from taking part in this study. However, this is an exciting opportunity for Year 7 pupils to get actively involved in live science. So I opened with this from the World Health Organization. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how that decision was arrived at. So this was the, the IARC monograph working group, that's the International Agency for Research on Cancer. 31 scientists deemed the best in their fields from 14 different countries. They assembled in 2011 and they had these different groupings to choose from. They could have chosen group 4, probably not carcinogenic to humans, but they didn't choose that. They could have chosen group 3, not classifiable as to its carcinogenicity, perhaps because we don't have enough research. They did not choose that. What they chose was group B, possibly carcinogenic to humans, and other substances in that category include lead, DDT, diesel fumes, and chloroform. And I wonder how we would all feel if we were being exposed or our children were being exposed all day long to any one of those substances. But what's more concerning to me than that is that of these eminent scientists, several of them have spoken out since this meeting and said that they were very disappointed, that this should have been a Group 2A or a Group 1. Things don't tend to move back off this list. They tend to move up. And the reason they felt that this was an underestimation, that it should have been a Group 1 in some cases, is because, as I mentioned, glioma, this extremely aggressive, non-treatable brain tumour, fulfils the Hill criteria for causality. The criteria that we designed to decide, does X cause Y? Yes, it does. And they also have mechanisms to explain that link. The things that, the, the lack of mechanism was what was felt to hold it back. So there was a, an admission, yes, we see the link, 
but if you can't describe every step in that process, we want to hold it back. And so some of these scientists are very unhappy about how that grouping turned out. And I think, with all of that information and so much more, that there are some human rights issues here, but particularly when it comes to children. Because many children, depending on their age group, are non-benefiting and non-consenting. They can't give consent. They can't read this literature and understand it and say, yes, I'm happy for you to irradiate me. They can't do that. And if you read the UN Convention on Rights for a Child, this breaches many of them. And if you look at the research that's being done, I would, I would say, um, perhaps take a bit of time and read the Nuremberg Code because some of it violates that. The precautionary principle was put together, and it, it reads something like this. There are a few different versions of it, but um, it applies where scientific evidence is insufficient, inconclusive, or uncertain, and evaluations indicate there are reasonable grounds for concern. That's all, reasonable grounds for concern. And that um, potentially dangerous effects on the environment, human, animal, or plant health may be inconsistent with the high level of protection chosen by the EU. In my opinion, we're way too late for the precautionary principle. How can we call it a precautionary when we've already re irradiated the entire population, including our children and unborn children? So it's really too late for this clause to be actioned. But that doesn't mean that we should not do anything at this point. And whose responsibility is it if you don't take that advice, if you don't take a precautionary approach? Where does the blame lie? And I think this is a really interesting issue and I'm not sure of the exact clarity, and I don't think many people are. But in terms of the health and safety issues related to radio frequency in the workplace, it lies with the employer. Mm. And lots of unions regarding schools and education have spoken out because of concerns about this, asking for moratoriums, bans, etc. There's so many, I can't list them all. And insurance companies, they're risk analysts. This is what they do, it's their specialty. And so I see them as the birds before the storm, and they are running from this. I don't now know of any insurance companies that will insure against the effects of RF. So are you insured if you decide to take that risk? The answer, I think, in the majority of cases is no. Medical docs have said are concerned, and these are all groups that have made big public statements on this. Please do go, go ahead and look those up, read them, because there's some very powerful statements from all of those groups. Other countries are taking a lot of action that we haven't, I don't have time to go into all of those, but again, I can get you the information if you would like it. PACE, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, have made some very strong statements and continue to do that. But I think there's a common misconception that industry has told us that this is safe, that that's where we focus our belief, our acceptance. And that is not true at all. That's never happened. Industry have very clear warnings in their guidelines for all of the devices that emit this kind of radiation that protects them. They say you can't use these devices unless they are more than, and it changes depending on your manual, but around 15 millimeters is about the smallest distance I've seen, up to eight inches from a printer aerial in one case. You can't use some of these devices without touching them. And if you touch them, you violate this advice, which means that you are potentially causing yourself thermal effects, let alone all the non-thermal ones. So industry isn't telling you this is safe, not at all. It's warning you in their own manuals. But who reads the destructions? Yeah. I think it's time. And this is the Vice President of the CTIA, the Wireless Association, saying, I want to be very clear, industry has not said once, once, that RF radiation is safe. There's another common misconception that schools have to do this, that there's pressure on them from somewhere that they won't get their ICT mark if they don't have wireless radiation in classrooms. And that is another complete fallacy. That is not true. You can have a cutting edge, state of the art IT system. None of us want to de deny our children access to the internet, which can be such a powerful and excellent learning tool. But you can achieve that without using radio frequency radiation. There are other considerations which are beyond the scope of this talk, but just, just to mention that this health concerns, although it's my area of interest, for many others that don't want to use RF, they have different reasons for not wanting to use it. Addiction kind of comes in still under mine because there's a physiological addiction as well as a psychological one involving dopamine and things that are released when you take recreational drugs. But it, I can't talk about that today, but there's all these other things, including interaction with chemicals in the workplace or in school, 
um, cyber threats and supervision issues, social interaction problems, and that's actually very important when it comes to learning. How do children learn best? There are huge amounts of literature on this now, and again, look at who funded the study before you take too much notice of it, but children learn best when they see you, when they look in your eyes, when they see your hands moving, when they feel your passion, when they hear your words. That is how children learn best. Again, I want them to have to learn how to use computers. We all do. That's very essential for their job. But how much of that do they need in their classroom? And it doesn't have to be delivered via microwave radiation. So, and other issues like security and longevity is better with non-wireless devices. So what must we do? We get to the crux of the useful stuff that, again, I really hope one day I can elaborate on more. But there is two ways of looking at it. There's some half measures that you can do in instantaneously, straight away. Minimising your use of RF technology. Replacing devices with low radiation alternatives. And by this, I mean in particular things like decked phones. I mentioned these walkabout landlines. Um, they emit all the time, even when you're not using them. And Sam Brightspark, who was environmentally conscious, said, that's a waste of energy. We're going to make a phone with an eco mode where it only puts out radiation when it's actually in use. Now, of course, that doesn't stop the user being irradiated quite heavily when they're actually using the phone, but it does lower the radiation for everyone else, and it stops the radiation when you're actually not using the phone. So it's obviously an improvement. Distance. I mentioned distance. Distance is in general your friend because it does drop the intensity. If you're unlucky and you fall into an intensity window, that kind of breaches that advice. But in general, I'd say it's a very healthy concept. It is a good thing. It just isn't ultimately 100% protective. Avoiding maximum power situations. This really applies to people using phones in cars. If you use a phone in a car without an external aerial, because you're moving and you're moving through cell zones, it's continuously on maximum power. If you have it near your head when you do that, that's a dangerous situation. Uh, minimising ELF fields, again, beyond the scope of our talk today, that's about normal household energy electrical frequencies, which is extremely low frequency, but also must be taken into account for health, because it is also a class 2B carcinogen. Grounding of devices is obvious, especially for the, those of you in here with an IT background, but often gets missed. Um, and headset misconceptions, I've already covered that really, but yes, don't think that using a headset and moving the transmission to another part of you is protecting your body. It is not. And Bluetooth devices right inside your ear, that's putting an RF field very close to your brain. So, defensible protection. What would stand up in a court of law if you were saying, I did the right thing? I knew the dangers, I was being conscientious, I was trying to protect my child. In my opinion, that means removing RF. Because just like with lung cancer, there are no half measures. Giving your child a low target cigarette isn't the right thing to do. But switching off devices obviously stops them emitting. You can do that straight away. Using aeroplane mode stops them emitting. So if a child is using a tablet to play a game, but it's in aeroplane mode, I don't have a problem with that. It still has a battery that creates a small EMF field, but so do lots of toys. You don't want them next to that all day. But it makes it much safer. It doesn't have this... RF field that in many cases is totally unnecessary. As quickly as possible, just withdraw the RF emissions. Use hard wiring, use fibre optics. There are some innovative new things coming on the market like Li-Fi, which is visible light technology that allows no wires but the use of visible light instead of microwave fields. That could end up being a more healthy solution to the wire problem, but that has not been biologically tested for safety either. And because it's using frequencies that, for example, colour temperature affects our biology, of course it does, because we're designed to cue with the ultraviolet light in our environment. So these are things that haven't been considered yet. If they're taken into account very carefully, this could be a great technology. But uh, it's being pioneered in one school in London at the moment, to my knowledge. So at the moment, I would say wide connections with your friends. You let your children use the internet and learn from it in a safer environment. It shouldn't be up to parents to protect their children in this way. It probably shouldn't really be up to governors or head teachers either because do they have time to read all this whilst doing their job? I'm not sure that they do, but as things stand right here, right now, this decision has come down to parents and governors and head teachers. It is your decision 
at a local level, it is 100% your decision. There is no pressure on you to use this technology if you feel it's not safe. And there are parents standing up for their right to have their child educated in a health and safety conscious environment all over the world. And they are winning that fight. It shouldn't be a fight, but in many cases it is. And they are proud when their school decides to take on board the science and the information and do the right thing. Some of those parents, via groups like Safe Schools Information Technology Alliance, CTEC, which is in this country, are using tools like this. This is a statement of accountability that they've put on their website for parents to download to give to their head teachers and governors board and say, are you informed that it's a class 2B carcinogen? Are you aware of the lack of safety testing? Are you aware that there are alternatives? Is there a good reason why you're using this instead of a safe alternative? Well, if, that's, if you could say yes to all of those things, then please sign here. I don't know of anyone who signed this form yet, but I'd be interested if they did. And I thought about this from both as a parent and from a medical perspective. Because if somebody wants to take my child at school on a trip out, I have to sign a consent form. And of course, I've been using consent forms for years in hospital every time I do anything with a degree of seriousness. And if you wrote a consent form for this, it's kind of, this is kind of how it would look. And there's so much more I could put on there. I made it small and simple. But I consent to my child being irradiated by a group 2B possible human carcinogen, <coughs> to being exposed to a toxin known to cause DNA damage and other biological disruption, such as multiple organ system disturbance, and that includes reproductive <coughs> impairment, neurological disruption, cardiological compromise, impaired learning ability, hormonal disruption. The list is so much longer. I would not sign that form. And if you would not be happy to sign that form, then I think all of us need to think about this on a totally different level. Because if you're not happy to sign a form like this, then we need to backtrack, we need to change our direction, we need to do something that on every level our conscience tells us is fair and right, and that we can defend to our children when they're old enough to understand. So in summary, we are electromagnetic, that is life, that is the essence of what makes all life on the planet tick. Nobody is telling us that this kind of radiation is safe, including industry themselves, and there are warnings from our own government. Additionally to that, credible academic bodies, a growing number, are giving us very serious warnings. They're highlighting the danger. They're trying to put a message out there. Non-thermal radio frequency emissions at very low levels can cause severe cellular damage and lead to potentially lethal conditions. Present safety standards are obsolete. They are not protective. And your child's health, as well as your own, is in your hands. There are steps that you can take to change this and to improve the environment for yourself and your children. Alternative inter internet solutions exist, so this doesn't mean stopping your child having a technological experience at school or learning in the way that we want them to, to secure their future. I mentioned right at the beginning FIRE, Physicians Health Initiative for Radiation and Environment. I founded this group in order to bring together medical professionals that have an interest in this subject so that we can learn at the highest level from our colleagues abroad, and I'll be honest, they're way ahead of us. So I am getting information from them and we are putting it together, we're doing research, we're helping to put forward awareness campaigns and I hope to open constructive dialogue with the PHE and the Department of Health to move this forward. And anyone in this audience or out there who would like to be part of this group, who feels they have something to offer, and you don't have to be a medical doctor, if you feel you have anything to offer the group then please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Thank you so much for listening to this very long talk and I've got to thank so many colleagues, I can't put them all on this slide, but so many different professionals around the world are contributing to this and able to give me the important research I need to help forward it on and to help guide my own. And there's a huge number of resources, people always tell me, where, where can I get information? Well, in this country, I've got a, a list of websites here, both here and abroad, and I can give you so much information. I have a form um, at the end. If you want to put your telephone number and email address, then I can send things to you, and you can be made aware of further presentations that there will be some. And ironic, in my last little picture there, that's a baby playing with an iPhone that has, uh, their mother's bought for them an iPhone rattle case. 
that's designed to protect your phone from your baby. <laughs> so thank you so much.